Uh, my name is Roger Horrocks uh, and I'm an underwater cinematographer. When I grew up, went to school, um, becoming an underwater cinematographer certainly wasn't one of the things that was on the agenda at all. Uh, it was a lawyer, doctor, accountant. So I never trained to become an underwater cinematographer, but I grew up close to the ocean and you know had a real passion for it and spent many years spearfishing as well. And it was through the spearfishing that I developed the what we call the field craft which is really the ability to feel comfortable in the water and to get close to animals. Um, and then it was much later in my life, in about 10 years ago, when I got onto a BBC production um, called The Great Tide, which was covering the sardine run in South Africa as an assistant. And I met Didier Nwaro, who was Jacques Cousteau's cameraman for 10 years. And that started the whole process of apprenticeship and that whole journey. Okay? I think the, you know, that's the critical thing with this industry is really associating with the very best people that you can because the best way to learn is to learn from people who are masters of their craft. Um, and that was cert has certainly been you know, the, the case in, in my instance. Well, I think um, there, are, there are certain cameramen, underwater cameramen, that, that specialize in you know, one particular thing. So we generally have what we call either benthic sequences, which is where you're working on the bottom, you're using tripods, you're often on rebreathers. And to be honest, it's, it's very much like a, um, a set that you'd see above land. You know, you've got, sometimes you've got dollies, you've got uh, underwater tripods. Um, you literally take your fins off, you've got your rebreather, and you're kind of walking around the bottom. And that takes a particular type of mentality and, and application. Then you get what we call blue water, which is the other extreme, which are kind of blue water shoots where the action, you could be out at sea for three weeks and you might only see that event happening for maybe 10 minutes. So you're talking 250 hours waiting for an event that happens for eight minutes and then you have to cover that entire event in a way that an editor can then, you know, represent it. So I think there is, there's a great degree of flexibility both in the craft and then the ability to work in different types of, you know, underwater conditions. I think, I think the, you know, the making of components that the BBC make, you know, they, they actually give a, a very accurate reflection of the reality. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of waiting and patience. I often call, describe an open water shoot as a, it's 95% meditation and 5% absolute application. Um, but I think that is, that for me, the, the, that's the hardest part really. It's making sure that you are absolutely prepared and in the right place. I mean, it's a cliche, you know, right place at the right time. But when that event happens, you have to be absolutely dialed in to get the coverage, because coverage is, is critical for this craft. There, there's been a lot of hype around how you know the new technology enables us to get a new look and i think i think there's there's a lot of validity in that in terms of you know the quality of the image the low light capability of of the cameras um, uh, and also the fact that you aren't limited by a roll of film for example but i still think that the most important thing for an underwater cinematographer is the thinking that you bring to the actual you know, to the scene and the way that you, you know, the, the different shots that you get and the way that you render it out. Um, but there's no doubt that, you know, things like slow motion, the new slow motion cameras enable us to represent the natural world in a way that gives you a, you know, a different, a different view and, and perhaps a deeper appreciation and a, and a different emotional response, which is obviously key to our craft. On Blue Planet 2, um, I worked on an octopus sequence, um, which was in the Green Seas program, and most remarkable behavior of a, of a common octopus that lives in a forest where there are kelp forests, where there are these um, pajama sharks that have this incredible sense of smell. And we'd seen this, I, I knew of this behavior through a colleague of mine, um, but I had no real idea, A, if we were gonna be able to, to capture you know, on, on camera, and B, whether um, you know, we would be able to, to do justice to, to this incredible phenomenon. Because it's one thing to see it, but then you know, to represent it is a whole nother story. So what I did was negotiated to have a two-year window, filming window, to, because the conditions in the Cape can be very difficult as well. And it was, it was just so difficult because we, especially in the beginning, we struggled to find the right language, the right visual language to actually create the mood and the emotion. 
Um, so it was an incredible learning experience. And it literally took us, I think, to create that sequence about 70 days in the field. Just recently, I mentioned that figures. It was 250 hours and I was on a ball for, for eight minutes. And that was towards the end of the, of the shoot. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting one. A very good colleague of mine, Hugh Pearson, who's um, a very talented producer, he, we've worked on a number of programs and we kind of laugh about this thing. Well, if you're gonna fail, fail big. And really what's behind that is you can't be scared of failure because especially with, with open ocean and with blue water shoots, you're gonna fail. You know, it's, it's, it's a given. Um, so it's not unheard of to send out a team for three weeks and then send them out again and, and get nothing. Um, so, you know, I think if, you, if you're someone who is exceptionally neurotic and scared of failure, you can have a tough time being a wildlife cinematographer. I think the, you know, the, the I mean, the, the paramount focus of any cinematographer is you, you know, you're writing with imagery um, and you have to evoke emotion in your audience. So, uh, and people are astoundingly visually literate in today's world. They, you know, they're bombarded by material all the time. So the standard is exceptionally high. I do think that underwater you can perhaps, you know, there's a perhaps a little bit more leniency because people haven't seen and aren't as exposed to as much of it as, as one would topside. But I think, you know, on the level that we're working at, you, you really are trying to get that exceptional shot. So they can't all be exceptional, but you really are, as, a, as another colleague would say, you know, every shot of Rembrandt. You, you really are trying to, um, because at the end of the day, it's not that many shots that go into a sequence. Um, so there's certainly a lot of pre-thinking that goes into that, but you are limited by the fact that you're in the natural world. You, you have very little control over you know, the lighting conditions. All you can really control is your position um, and then work with, within those variables. But I think it's more important to get you know, fewer aesthetically powerful shots than it is just to get coverage, definitely. I think if, for me, it's, it's um, you know, the, the, the things that I'm most proud of um, are, I've been working on a, a dolphin film for Disney and then I, I shot um, a dolphin sequence uh, for Blue Planet 2, which was in the opening program with the Gorgoning, the dolphins were rubbing through the, the you know, and then there was a second one where they were playing with coral. Um, and something that I really try and do is, is, is move a lot underwater. So it's a, you know, it's a, and it comes, I think, from my spearfishing background, but I, I like to put a lot of movement, you know, into, into the shots. And the other thing, as an underwater cinematographer, which is unlike to a top side, is, is you're actually engaging those animals. So you have to, you know, it's, you're not in a car shooting them at a distance. You're actually, they're very aware of your presence. You know, you're trying to minimize the distance between you and them. You're trying to minimize the water column at all times to get the image quality. So there's a whole dance that takes place between you and the animals. Um, you don't want to disrupt them, you, but you want them to feel comfortable. Um, so I think, you know, the work that I'm most proud of has been the, the, the dolphin work, which, which took a long time to get their trust and to, to get into that and then reveal those very intimate moments of them sleeping and doing all those things that they wouldn't do if they didn't feel comfortable. Well, I think, I think to, um, you know, I think to, to, to get in, it's obviously tough to get into the craft because there, there aren't actually that many positions available because it's actually quite a small industry in the greater scheme of things. But number one, you've got to be like a fish underwater. So, you know, really develop those skills, scuba diving, rebreathers, um, free diving. You really need to feel supremely comfortable. Um, the second thing is, you know, cinematography. The same principles of cinematography apply underwater as they do topside. And that is definitely something you can learn. You know, you might be born with a, a really good eye, but you can develop you can develop that eye and you can learn how to, how, uh, how to shoot and compose. Um, and the third thing really is, you know, try and get in touch with people in the industry and find a way of getting onto shoots in, in whatever capacity it can be. Because it's those relationships with producers, with cameramen, that ultimately get you into the industry and, and allow you to progress.